I met Sue a few months ago, earlier this year, wasn't it, at uh, a Liverpool Diocese Conference, um, uh, and I was there speaking as well, and uh, Sue was there with a few of the students from the school where she's the head teacher, and she gave the presentation, which uh, is, you're going to see a similar presentation in a moment, and afterwards Sue came up to me, and I don't know if you remember, but Sue said, I'm sorry, I haven't really done prayer spaces yet, and that's what this day was all about, the Liverpool Diocese Day. And I, my response to her was, but Sue, what you're doing yeah. in your school, the, the, the kind of the atmosphere and the, the character, the environment that you're creating in the school is what many of us are aspiring to, that spiritual life woven throughout the school. So I'm really delighted that Sue's here. Uh, thank you very much for making it. It's an absolute across. pleasure from Southport. Um, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, everybody. It's lovely to see you all. Um, I'm the head teacher from a um, Church of England primary school in Southport, but we have a very multicultural, multi-faith um, population. So we have Christian children, we have Jewish children, Muslim children, Hindu children, and children of absolutely no faith where their parents are absolute atheists. And it works. What we do in our school seems to work. And I'm hoping that you all can help me today because I'm not sure quite what's going on in my school, but I know something special is going on. And I'm trying to, um, on this journey that began when I took over the headship there seven and a half years ago, I've just been sort of stumbling along really. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that we've done and some of the thoughts that I'm, I had and I'm having even as we speak about what's actually happening in my school because something special is happening. Um, now I couldn't really, when I went to Phil's conference earlier on this year and I thought, what is, what, what is it? What, how, how can I describe prayer spaces? Because I hadn't heard about prayer spaces before Phil asked me to come and and, and um, speak a little bit about what, what was going on in my school. And I realized that for the past seven and a half years, what Phil said was actually true, that we'd been doing it all along, but we hadn't called it that. And actually, they were popping up everywhere. Um, God is everywhere. And we didn't even realize some of the things that we were doing were having such an impact. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. And I first thought of the concept of woven prayer, that... What we're doing in our school is lots and lots of different things that weave together. And it was this poem by Benjamin Malachy Franklin. I don't know if you know it, but um, it's not the Benjamin Franklin, which is what I thought for a while. <laughs> it's actually somebody completely different. But I'm just going to read this to you because I think that, that the idea of woven prayer came from this. My life is but a weaving between the Lord and me. I may not choose the colors. He knows what they should be. For he can view the pattern upon the upper side, while I can see it only on this, the underside. Sometimes he weaves in sorrow, which seems so strange to me, but I will trust his judgment and work on faithfully. It is he who fills the shuttle, and he knows what is best. So I shall weave in earnest and leave to him the rest. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needed in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. And I thought when I read that, that sums up exactly what we're trying to do in our school. So I thought, right, what's the frame then? What do we hang everything that we do on? Because I'm a great believer in not having bolt-ons, and I could see that prayer spaces could tick boxes if we're not very careful. They have to hang on something. Um, and I believe that it's our Christian values. When I look back and see where we started seven years ago was as a new head teacher, um, it was about securing what we believe in as a school. And I didn't want that to become um, something that the governors sat down around a table and said, right, what are our Christian values? They're this, 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 and this, and tell everybody. Um, I wanted it to be something that was part of our whole community so that we could all 
um, join in this spiritual journey that we were going on and it fitted the school. So we got the children to make dream catchers. Um, we called it our hopes and dreams. And on those dream catchers, and there's some things over here that, that I think um, show what we did, was we started to explore what we believed in as a community. And the children wrote their hopes and dreams on dream catchers, and we hung them in what we would now describe as a prayer space, I suppose, in the hall. And we looked at each other's. Um, and the children had some great ideas. I mean, our children come from all over the world. We've got 23 different countries that our children come from, 18 different languages. So there's quite a lot of separation and people that don't see their members of their families for years on end. And that comes through um, quite a lot in what the children and the parents um, really want to connect with and want to think about. So I would love to see my dad. I wish to help Pakistan let the world change. And then another boy. I wish the universe was made out of Lego. <laughs> what a great dream that is. So once we made our dream catchers, we also shared, because we wanted um, our spiritual journey to involve parents as well. So we, we did a competition, and that's in, in one of the books as well. Um, and asked families what their hopes and dreams were for the future. So almost, perhaps their dining room table became a prayer space at home where they could sit down and talk as a family about what their hopes and dreams were. And there's one of the examples of an expression of what the children and, and their family thought. Um, peace and laughter and love around the world. From that then, we tried to synthesize what we believed in as a school. And we came up with seven Christian values. And because there are seven, and there are seven classes, we thought we would attach one to each class. So that by the time the children left the school, they would have had a really deep, hopefully meaningful experience with each of those values. I didn't know what we were going to do, but what I did know was that you can't just stop there. And I know a lot of places, a lot of schools might think, that's job done. We've got seven values, we've got a mission statement, we can put it up in the main hall, that's it. But I, I knew that unless we keep revisiting it and keep it alive, they would just become wallpaper. And the more I do this, the more I get convinced that you have to keep going and you have to do things afresh. You can't say, right, I've done that and that will stay with the children forever and we're moving on because you have to keep revisiting things in my experience. So there's our seven Christian values and there are the um, year groups that they fit with. And you'll see if you have a little look at some of the things we've done, that everything is based around those seven values. And there's one little prayer space in the reception classroom, which is their value of love. Um, and I think actually that's our next step because I think that's more of a display. So what I'm looking for today is to think about how we can turn that into something that's more living. So that's what I'm hoping to get out of today, Phil. Thank you. So our massive threads, the big threads that go on this loom, um, I said that we should do something every year. We have to do um, an experience every year around our values that's big so that it keeps them alive and keeps them in our children's thoughts so that rather than leaving it where it just becomes something that you know that sits in the corner so we we've, we've done lots of things and this was even before i knew about what the work that phil was doing but we worked with for example um a local uh, pottery to make an indoor faith trail where children expressed what they thought um they interpreted um, their class value as so they're up around the school um, outside each of the classrooms so that's our indoor faith trail um, and that one was love this one is justice and um, some of the thoughts that it just amazes you doesn't it that these are 11 year olds have come up with um, their idea about what justice is from justice on the playground to justice around the world to sharing pound notes to um to peace. 
Um, another big thing that we did was um, work with this, a, a diocese organization called Faiths for Change, um, and they do environmental work in schools. So we bid for some money, which is another good thing to do, um, and built an infant peace garden. Because the children said to us when we were looking at our values, they said, we haven't got anywhere to sit. Um, it's a, we, we are in an urban school, and no fields, no grass, just playgrounds. And they said, it's never peaceful where I am. <laughs> there were always people running around me. So we sectioned off a part of one of the playgrounds and the children designed it with um, these people from the diocese um, and came up with their own ideas. Um, and we got some money and we got a willow weaver. And we've, we've come up with a structure that later became a venue for a prayer space, which was um, a twigloo, which we've adapted and used in lots of different ways. And of course, the children you know, bring pebbles into it and they, they adapt it um, and they sit in there and that's a peaceful little space for them. And we've used that um, in d at different times. And then they wanted a storyteller's chair. And we didn't think that that was something that they wanted, but they did. And somebody at church made one and they wanted our school prayer put on the back of it. So we did that as well. Um, and that's another little space for them. Now, this was an interest. This is where I've begun to reflect that what we're doing isn't actually the big things aren't the most important things. Because I don't know if you're aware that the Gloucester Diocese do ex these uh, packs. And one of them's down there. Um, experience Pentecost, experience Harvest. And this is where they are really prayer spaces. But that's where I first picked up this idea that's later transform, transform itself. But we're right next to our church. So last year, we... Um, I did experience Pentecost and people at church sat at the stations and did activities with the children. The children went round in groups, um, experienced Pentecost. Fantastic day. The children loved it. They had a great time. And we really felt they understood the very difficult concepts around Pentecost. So this year, when I stood up in assembly and said, hey, everybody, the worship table's red. What time of the year is it? Mm, don't know. Uh, it's Pentecost. And they all went, what? <laughs> I said, do you remember Pentecost that we'd last year in church? No, nothing. they completely forgotten. And I took a step back and thought, okay, um, I'm going to have to go with this. this. This big event that I thought would stay in their lives forever, they actually forgot it very quickly. And it was from then I thought, you need to keep going and you, you, whatever you do, you need to change it and adapt it. The children change. They forget things. It might have been the best experience they had that day. But by the next day, they've gone on to the next thing and they very quickly forgot it. So I think that was a real big lesson for me. Um, this year, and it was in the middle of this that I came across Phil because I thought we need to do an outdoor, prayer, uh, outdoor faith trail. We've done an indoor one, but our outdoor space needs brightening up. It's an opportunity for children to get outside and experience spirituality outdoors. And then I also thought, and it's a good chance to build these really great permanent prayer spaces with fountains and rockeries and um, artificial trees that can stay there forever and be and brighten up our outdoor space and be a constant reminder um, to everybody and somewhere the children can all go and sit and, and, ex and have a lovely experience. And it didn't actually work out like that. And I'm actually really, really pleased it didn't because of what I just said to you, because I think very quickly it would have become just a feature, just something children walk by every day um, and, f and have forgotten about. I think temporary and meaningful and small and from the children is where we are at the moment. But I think I've got um, a, a little slideshow of our outdoor faith trail. We worked with um, a photographic company called greatphotosbykids.com and the children took all the photographs. The company then took that away and made a DVD, which is what I'm just about to show you, and a book. So although the prayer spaces ended up being temporary, 
we've got the book that keeps it alive for us, that, that, that stays in our uh, main entrance that the children can then go and sit and reflect. And I think that's a much, perhaps, a better way of going about things. But I'm hoping that if I press this, um, I'll be able to play you. The, it's only a short DVD. Um, and this is Love. Year six and reception children work together to make a Mexican God's eye. They looked through the eye to find ways God shows his love for us and the world. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. After hearing the story of blind Bartimaeus, children wrote their own hopes on paper flowers, floated them on water and watched them open up. And that comes from your website, Phil. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Forgiveness. Children acted key moments from the story of Joseph. They thought about the power of forgiveness and worked with an artist to record their reflections on a mural. You are forgiving and good, O oh Lord, abounding in love to all who call on you. trust. Older and younger children together thought about the love and trust shown by Moses' mother as she pushed her baby down the river. Children made trust locks describing how they have shown trust in someone and locked them to our shelter. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Peace. Through the story of Abigail, older children explored how we can be at peace with ourselves and how this can bring peace to others. They painted peace symbols on pebbles and made a peace circle. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Reverence. Working with faith for change, older children planted a wildflower garden to attract mini beasts. Thinking about the parable of the sower, they reflected on the different choices, challenges and opportunities life brings. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves.
justice. Through reading Henry's Freedom Box, our oldest and youngest children thought about freedom from slavery. They wrote messages of freedom on paper birds and tied them to a basket, representing how Henry escaped. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. All those photographs were taken by the children. Then I thought, right, we have those big things that happen every year. Then we have what I would describe as our middle-sized threads. So these are groups of children or things that happen more often, still mainly adult-led. So um, our worship table in the hall I would see as a middle-sized thread. We encourage children to, to write prayers and hang them on our prayer tree. Um, and we do, obviously, um, class assemblies round, are based around our values to parents. So that really reinforces um, the message about, about each class's value. But again, I learned to lesson because children started saying to me, can we write our own prayers and hang them on the prayer tree? And I said, yes, of course. And then, of course, they just wrote them on bits of paper and hung them on the tree. And I thought, that looks a bit tatty, even though the prayers were absolutely beautiful. Um, and so I thought, right, well, well, I'll make some prayer leaves um, out of green card. So we got lots of prayer leaves out of green card. We left them by the, by the, um, the prayer tree. And, and the quality of the prayers went down. Because the children were thinking about, oh, if I join two leaves together with a bit of glue and get a bit of felt tip pen and, and I make this look really pretty. And they, they'd forgotten what they were actually doing. So I'm hoping, I've, I'm still carrying on with these prayer leaves, but the quality of what the children are writing and thinking about isn't as good as it was when they just wrote it on a little bit of paper. And I think that was a strong message for me. And I'm hoping that once they get over this thing about all the new prayer leaves, that it will start to come back again. But it's something that I'm thinking about at the moment, because I might have to take them away again and have a tatty tree, but something that's a bit more meaningful. Um, and then just things that, you know, that we do with groups of children. Perhaps we get a bit of money from somewhere. And um, this is um, Ethiopian prayer scrolls um, in our peace garden again. So just using little opportunities to do things with groups of children. A prayer project we did working with a local artist. The children thought that they would like to represent our school prayer in terms of, of a 3D representation. So um, <laughs> they, made, they made this um, statue and we put it in the hall. And it was, a, a, for a certain amount of time, it was, a, I suppose, a prayer space because you pressed a button and it said the prayer. It's got a beating heart, so you could feel the heart beating. But, um, and then again, then his head got knocked off by a football. And, uh, <laughs> and then actually I thought, actually, he's just sitting there in the corner gathering dust. So we threw him away. Um, I wasn't sad to see the back of him, really. But um, that just taught me again, you've got to keep it alive. You cannot just have something and think that that's job done and everybody will, you know, embrace it. Um, now, um, I talked to you about children making up prayers. This is before I introduced the prayer leaves, by the way. I'm sure we wouldn't have got this quality had it been on one of my nice, shiny ones. Um, but these, this is starting to, cut, to become more and more important, I think, because it's coming from the children. So instead of me saying, let's have this prayer space here or let's do this activity, the children are starting to, to do things for themselves and... The one on the right really um, just made me step back because this arrived on my desk, as most of the prayers do, um, and it was written on a paper aeroplane. So this little boy had made a paper aeroplane, and it was a prayer for um, the missing um, Malaysian airline, um, and he'd written it on a paper aeroplane. 
Now, I'm quite cross, actually, because when the Ofsted inspector came in a month after the first conference I did with you, Phil, in April, and um, he sat down and said, tell me all about SMSC. And I sh all he wanted to, to, to know, really, was how many boys did ballet. And once I said that there were boys doing ballet, it was a big tick in the box, and he was on to the next thing. And then I brought that plane out, and I said, look, if you want to just see how children engage with the spiritual, um, this comes from them. And he took it away with him. And he said, can I have that? And I thought, oh, mm, okay, thinking it might appear in the report. But that was it, gone. Never seen it again. And I'm quite cross. I agreed for him to have it, really. Um, the other prayer is, it sat there, but that touched, that touched us all because the little boy stood up in assembly and he read the prayer out. And we prayed of his great-grandmother in Venezuela, who he was never going to see again because it was a long way away and she, she, was, um, she was not very well. And it was highly unlikely that he was going to see her again. So we all said a prayer for her. But those threads, I think, are the most important. Not the ones that come from me, all the big things that we do. It's, it's these little ones. And that has got to be the strongest thread. I was sat in my room doing data. And it just got pushed underneath the door. And I thought, oh, what's this disturbing me? Somebody's in trouble. I've got to go and see. And it was a little girl called Alicia, who's five years old. And um, she just posted that through my door. I wonder if anybody knows what it says. Anybody can translate five-year-old's writing? It's actually written behind you there. It says, our father, who, who art in heaven, hello, be thy I name, trespasses. <laughs> so, I mean, that just stopped me, and I thought, that is the most important thing. Just Let's just make sure that everything we do comes from the children, is meaningful the ch for from the children, and is um, constantly refreshed. Now, I couldn't bring my three um, children with me today, but in a minute, I'm going to show you. They, they came to the last conference, but it was a bit too far for them to travel, and I'll show you what they said, but... Um, are we making a difference? Well, um, I'd done this um, little talk at Phil's last conference about um, woven prayer. And whenever people come into our school, and I don't know what it is, and I'd love somebody to tell me and help me understand why it is, they say it feels different. They say there's something special going on here. We like being here. The children seem really happy, caring, um, thoughtful, considerate. And it, it, the atmosphere seems different to other places where they have been. And I don't know why that is. Perhaps you can help me. But the offset inspector, when they gave their feedback, said, um, uh, it seems that SMSC is woven through the life of the school. And that made us sit back because that's exactly what I talk, talked about. So obviously to other people, it appears that that's the case. And I think it's something to do with all these different threads that all hang upon that same loom. Um, and this is what our children say. Oh, I go back. You can think about it more as you grow up in school and you can make up deep prayers as you get older. We have comfy sleepers and chairs where I like to sit and think of ideas I can use for prayers. It's important to have spaces to pray because God, God listens to our prayer and he, um, even if it doesn't happen in the way that you pray for, it, it happens in a different way. When I make up a prayer, I think about what's happening around the world, even though we don't hear about everything in the news, and I like to wonder about that. If something bad happens in the world, I would like to help, even if it's far away. Prayer, prayer helps, I think. So what next? I think the threads are easily broken. 
I think they're there and they're solid and they weave together. The small ones, I think, are much more important than the big ones, although they're all important. But I think that you need to keep weaving. I don't think you've got a finished cloth ever. Thank you.